Christina and I'm Layla. Welcome back to our channel, Elementary My Dear, where we make nutrition science easy for you to digest. Today we're going to talk about how much alcohol you need for good health. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss one of our videos. I think alcohol is a very interesting thing because, you know, technically it is a drug, but I feel like it's like very, especially in our culture, like very, very common, very commonplace. Alcohol is kind of like a fixture as part of our culture. Alcohol has a very prominent place in North American culture and a lot of other cultures around the world, like having something to drink with your dinner or serving drinks at social events, you champagne for mm -hmm. celebration, drinking beer when you're watching games. Game. I, I feel like there's a lot of cultural and societal things that involve alcohol. A social thing or a celebratory thing or a relaxation yes, thing. Yes, I think like, you know, like the wine mom like stereotype is like kind of part of our, our culture and you'll see it on media. Women get home from work, they have their glass of wine to deal with their like shitty husbands and their annoying kids. Alcohol is very, very common in our in our culture. That prevalence kind of skews the way we talk about it in like a health perspective. Even when it comes to things like the Mediterranean mm -hmm. diet that involves you know some red wine many people do feel like a certain amount of alcohol is a part of a healthy diet today we're going to talk about whether that is true i guess we could start off by talking about what alcohol actually is for those of you who are unacquainted an alcohol drink is a drink that contains ethyl alcohol so ethanol there are many different types of like in the chemistry sense like alcohols but ethanol is the only one that won't kill you this comes from the fermentation of the sugars in fruits and grains and plant matter what's really interesting is that the reason that we developed the ability to process alcohol so as i mentioned we have all these other forms of alcohols from a chemistry perspective that are deadly is because from way back when we were eating a lot of fruits and stuff that were fermented but then we've kind of gone beyond what nature's naturally doing where it's fermenting fruit on trees to fermenting fruit in bottles for ourselves it does provide calories seven calories per gram but it's actually an anti-nutrient which means that it inhibits the absorption and use of other nutrients specifically b vitamins alcohol is super interesting in terms of how it affects your body and your brain so when you consume alcohol it's mostly absorbed in the stomach and the small intestine and it can reach your brain within five to ten 10 minutes where it works its magic or wreaks havoc depending okay. on the amount of the situation who you are all, all of those things. things. When alcohol reaches your brain, it actually prompts the release of serotonin and dopamine. And anyone that's consumed alcohol is probably familiar with the early signs of a buzz, which involves things like, you know, feeling more relaxed, more social, more confident, maybe even more happy. Alcohol is actually a central nervous system depressant, meaning that it slows things down. And it does that by binding to a, something called glutamate. Glutamate is actually an excitatory neuro transmitter so when it prevents that from working and doing its job it actually slows everything down which is where you know after you're drinking a little more you might notice some slurred speech or blurred vision your coordination might be a little wonky considering all that it's crazy how long it took for us to put into place like legislation and policies you know limiting people's ability to operate vehicles and like do all these different things under the influence of alcohol when like you know i'm sure even in the 60s people knew you're you're drinking Thinking you're probably a little bit less coordinated. Reaction time is lower. I mean, if the prohibition has taught us anything is don't take alcohol away from that the is people. True. That is very true. <laughs> this specific drug, I think there's a stronger attachment, it seems mm -hmm. like that's pervasive throughout our society compared to other drugs where I feel like it's not quite the same. And you know, you're using the term drug there. And I think because alcohol is so pervasive, we almost forget that it is a drug. But you know, as you mentioned, it has all those effects in your brain. So it is a drug just like cannabis, just like cocaine heroin ecstasy when you hear all those terms you're like oh. i do find it interesting because something like cannabis is arguably more benign mm -hmm. than alcohol and yet alcohol has still made its way into like and stayed in our society you it's can sit and drink a whole bottle of wine in front of someone and they won't be like are you good? okay are you okay okay the reason we wanted to talk about this is because research actually has found that alcohol at certain levels may be protective for health that's what the research seemed to show. There's a phenomenon, if you want to call it that, called the J-shaped curve, which actually is something that we see with a lot of nutrients in general. And what the J-shaped curve is, is think of the x-axis being the amount of a nutrient or a food being consumed, and the y-axis being level of risk for a certain adverse health outcome. For a lot of nutrients, and what we also saw with alcohol, is that there's a J-shaped curve. So at the lower end of the intake, 
intake, you saw a slightly higher risk. And then as you increase your intake a little bit, the risk goes down and then the curve goes back up as the amount that you're consuming goes further higher. And depending on the food or the nutrient that you're talking about, precise shape of that J is going to be different. Where that lowest level of risk is will also be different. Mm -hmm. But that's just a general trend that we see with a lot of different nutrients, including things like sodium. The data seemed to show that people that never consumed alcohol actually had slightly higher risk for certain adverse health outcomes. I think this messaging got out to the world and I think that is the general thought that drinking alcohol in moderation is actually good for you. That finding has been found quite a few times using cohort studies, particularly in the UK and the US. I think that is the basis for a lot of our guidelines around drinking. Two standard drinks a day for women and three standard drinks a day for men up to 10 drinks a week for women and up to 15 drinks a week for men which seems a lot my bias like when i read that mm -hmm. i was blown away because that seems like a lot you know like you said for men it's up to three drinks a day most days well, at the same time, five or more drinks within one occasion is considered binge drinking. That's based on this data that you see where compared to not drinking, having up to two drinks a day does not increase risk. But more recently, this whole idea is being challenged and even those guidelines are being questioned. There's some thought now that maybe those limits should be lowered. And the reason for that is because Perhaps a lot of the data that was looking at alcohol consumption and risk for health outcomes might be inherently flawed. These are cohort studies. They study a group of people over a very long period of time. The first studies in this area were comparing people who weren't drinking at the time of data collection to those who were drinking. The issue there was that a lot of people stopped drinking because they have an illness. If you already have an illness, your chance of dying are higher. That was a little bit confounding. They figured out that was kind of a limitation and they started looking at people who never drank to begin with. They actually found that people who never drank to begin with also have a higher risk of having a chronic disease at the beginning. So it's not really fair to look at their long-term outcomes. You know, this is like a very hot topic in the, the nutrition research field is you know, we know alcohol is an anti-nutrient and it's a drug and it affects you in all these different ways. Why are we seeing this J-shaped curve? So because of all the limitations of looking at people that never drink alcohol, a more recent study decided to not include that group, but basically look at every other frequency of consumption and follow them to see what the health outcomes look like. With this study, it was actually a very dose-dependent relationship. The greater the alcohol consumption, the greater the risk for poor health outcomes. But because this data was showing more of a linear relationship as opposed to a J-shaped curve, it really kind of called into question all the previous research that implied a J-shaped curve. As we always say, you can't use one study to make an overall claim, but because they use this different methodology, it kind of really shows that this is a big question mark. And this has been a big question mark for a very long time. Even beyond the limitations that you mentioned, I think there's so many other confounding variables at play too. Like we talked about, you know, alcohol is a very social thing. It's a social activity. So I don't know if maybe people that drink a little bit actually just have a larger social mm -hmm. circle, more social supports. And we know that those things influence health outcomes as well. So I don't know if those types of variables have been taken into account. And that's a hard thing to measure, really. Exactly. But just like all of our cohort studies that we look at, they ask these people like once, maybe a couple times over the course of however long, and they're just like, how much do you drink? And can we assume that that's the same amount over the course of decades? Food intake and alcohol intake, when it's self-reported, it's notoriously unreliable or inaccurate. It's hard to estimate your own intake of those foods if you're not meticulously calculating it. And also there's other variables, you know, some people might feel like they need to give a more socially acceptable answer. There's a lot of psychological elements in there as well. well can you imagine you have a health researcher asking you how much you drink. Our main takeaway here is that I know like a lot of us have been told that maybe, you know, having a glass of wine every day or, you know, drinking a little bit might actually be protective. If the evidence does not show that to be the case for sure. I think, like you said, there is a question mark. But at the end of the day, I think if you aren't already drinking alcohol, I think we can confidently say that you don't need to add alcohol into your lifestyle in order to gain health. And on the flip side, 
If you're drinking in excess of the recommended limits right now, you might benefit from cutting back. Alcohol is a drug. If you are concerned that you know your alcohol use is getting in the way of how you want to live your life, there are lots of great resources available and we'll put some of those in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you never miss a video. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Thanks for watching. Bye! Bye.